toutes et à tous. On va essayer de... Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to try and stick to the time. My name is Valeria Rodriguez. I am in charge of advocacy in the Maxime La France organization. And I am delighted and honored to moderate this round table. I would like to thank Convergence for organizing this round table as part of this 3.0 forum. And I would like to thank the members of this round table. I'm going to invite the different members of the panel to join me here to start this session. We are going to talk about fair transition. We want to know what are the levers for an integrated approach that would take into account human environmental rights at the international level. This topic um, came up um, because we were fighting against inequalities and as part of different organizations represented today, uh, this is a topic that is very dear to us. For about 20 years, this fair transition concept as defined in the 1990s by union movements aims at reconciling uh, the environmental preservation, the fight against climate change and decent labor which are all three concepts that are really important to us. And since 2015, this uh, fair transition has, the, the concept has been enlarged uh, to a systemic change, a change in model, a change in our economies to have more environmental and sustainable um, fairness. And we talk about fairness when talking about climate justice. This is a concept that we've heard Uh, a lot these past few years and in this concept we want to include the youth we want to include women in governing spaces be it at local national or international level and we also want to include um, the rights of workers and communities uh, throughout the whole supply chain this is a concept that is well defined but sometimes defined by different players, different organizations, and there can be differences in the different definitions. So we would like today to very concretely define the keys in order to implement this transition and wonder how we can make sure that it's long lasting and efficient over time. And for, to tackle this question, we have an exceptional panel. Thank you very much. We have uh, Manon Aubry. She is a European parliamentarian since 2019. Uh, she worked for Oxfam as a advocacy uh, director for social justice. And you're, we are going to talk about the European level with you more specifically. We also have Hélène Jufekit with us. Thank you for being with us. You are part of the diagnosis Uh, public economy department at the French Development Agency. Your department uh, initiates research on global challenges such as the low carbon transition, biodiversity, social cohesion, the analysis of macroeconomic risks and governance challenges. So it's interesting to have someone from the research world with us today. We also have Thomas Duguet with us. Uh, you are in charge of uh, Maxence Africa operations based in Dakar, uh, Senegal. You used to be a consultant and you're convinced that citizen commitment is crucial if we want to operate the necessary systemic cha changes that we need in order to tackle the SDGs. You are going to tell us a little bit more about this later on. We also have Niels Peterson. You joined the Global Pact. Uh, in the French network in April, so not long ago. After 15 years uh, working on social multiplayer challenges uh, at EDF and within the La France Sengage Foundation and a think tank on organizations. So thank you very much for being with you with us, Rafa. We're going to be able to talk about and discuss the, the role of companies in this transition. I would like to give all four of you a challenge. We said that this transition has been defined by many different organizations, but in two minutes, 
Would you like, would you mind defining your organization's approach when it comes to this fair transition? And could you tell us why it is important to have an integrated approach on these socioeconomic challenges as well as environmental and climate related challenges? Maybe we could start with Hélène. Could you uh, tell us how the French Development Agency's research department uh, is tackling the, the notion of, of fair transition? Well, first, thank you very much for inviting me to partake in this panel and to address this uh, very current and relevant theme. First, at the AFD, we've discussed and reflected upon this concept of fair transition. But as you said, it's more than a concept. Um, and initially, fair transition was only focusing on the military, for instance, in the US and in South Africa, then on the coal sector. But at IFD, we don't want to focus only on a sectorial approach or on a monetary compensation or offset uh, approach. We want to have a holistic approach. We want to see a shift in the current paradigm. And in order to obtain this fair transition, of course, we think in terms of climate change, social impact, but we need to think about this um, environmental transition. So it's not only about the energy transition, we're really addressing all development actions, both on the environmental and social side of things. And of course, we reflect on the notion of prosperity, because this is something that is really important in many countries where we uh, have operations. So we have a holistic approach and differentiated approach. We know that this notion of fair transition doesn't mean the same thing whether you live on one side of the world or the other side of the world. And it's to be created, this definition. It really depends on the context and the society that you're in. Uh, in the research department, we uh, really do our best in order to analyze the context in which we're working. This is something that we do on a very thorough uh, fashion. And we also make sure that we have a dialogue because these are very sectorial challenges, but we want to listen to all players at all levels. So with the governments, we discuss with governments, but also with uh, at territorial level. So it's a holistic approach, uh, understanding the different contexts and with a dialogue based approach. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction, because I, I think it's a perfect segue to give the floor to Toma from Mexico for Africa. Because we've been talking about dialogue, you talked about dialogue, and it's true that social dialogue and uh, factoring, factoring in what's happening in the field is important. So could you tell us what is your definition of fair transition? Well, uh, fair transition is, uh, the definition of fair transition is important. And before tackling the definition of fair transition for us, we wanted to think about what was the situation what was the environmental situation um, for the youth and for the Western African context. It's quite simple. 50% of the population is less than 20 years old, um, and there is not enough work. About 3 million jobs are created uh, for the youth at continental level when we would need 20 million of them. So based on this uh, situation, we understood that there was a critical need a necessary necessity to be more inclusive and to include the youth more to make sure that they contribute to the society that they have the possibility to act, to act and to take action because it's the same thing it's true that women in africa have an economic importance that is paramount because they work in the rural agricultural sector and mainly the most vulnerable and threatened jobs. So this transition needs to be um, to make this world more sustainable. We've seen the impacts of climate change in Africa, Afghanistan, but also in Europe. We've seen it firsthand. So taking into account the potential consequences of climate change in the coming years is essential. There will be no possible transition if we don't take into account all these elements. And the last item that I wanted to talk about is that this fair transition needs to be shared. Uh, this fair transition should not only be beneficial to uh, a portion of the population, as Ellen was said, is saying, it needs to be shared with all the beneficiaries, because it's the people that are in the field that have 
this needs, this need for this transition. And the ones that will probably be in the best position to use the actions and projects that are implemented on a daily basis, because we need long-term impact. But we also need the population to take on uh, these actions. And we, this means that we need to reflect, to co-create uh, these projects with the government's donors and community grassroots communities. This is why we have so much more to do. Thank you very much. Now, giving the floor to Nils Petersen. Um, we said that uh, companies have um, a role to play and a responsibility as employer, but also as organization uh, that can help contribute to this shift in paradigm in model because companies will have to change the, the way that they're operating. So at the Pacte Mondial, uh, what is your definition of a fair transition? Well, you're right. There are a lot of challenges to tackle for companies nowadays. The Pacte Mondial is actually an initiative um, initiated by the UN. So I will define this fair transition based on the UN definition. You're right, we were created in 2019 from a, a union federation, um, and we tried to define fair transition. Now we can debate, but it's about making the economy greener and an uh, inclusive and fair way as much as possible for all people involved by creating decent labor opportunities and by um, marginalizing and, and by not letting leaving anyone behind. So this reminds us of the 2030 agenda. So for the for us, it's a social contract that puts the SDGs at the heart of our vision to guarantee fundamental freedoms and human rights. The goal is also to stimulate our economy's transformation and the transformation of our societies in order to tackle climate change and stop the destruction of our environment. And we know that companies can only be changed and transformed if employees are involved. Thank you. Giving the floor to Manon Aubry, you are MP at the European Parliament, you are the voice of the public sphere of, of citizens. So what is the role of your group, the group that you represent at the Parliament? And how do you define that transition? First, I will be quite abrupt. I'm always a bit vigilant when it comes to concepts that become a little trite. And uh, for instance, the environmental planning that was talked about by Emmanuel Macron um, was uh, has become completely trite and empty. These are concepts that have become empty over time. We know that we need to change our direction. We are at a crossroads. Our planet is at a, at a crossroads, and we need to change our direction. This is why we're, we're talking about, we talk about the fact that we need to, to, to operate a change. Now, it's about making decisions. Do we want to manufacture SUVs, private jets, uh, phones that can't be fixed? This is part of the growth. So if we rebalance it out, this will be a fair transition, but we can also decide to create health infrastructures, etc., etc. These are decisions that we need to make. Now, the second question is how do we produce? Uh, do we produce by exploiting Uyghurs and forced labor? We will talk about um, supply chains on the other side of the world, or do we decide to have supply chains and manufacturing processes here, respecting all the different standards and human rights. And also in this fair transition, we need to wonder how can we fund this? Who pays for this transition? Because again, I'll be 
probably a little abrupt, but this we know that this is not something that can be done overnight. Um, we need to change our consumption traditions and funding modes, manufacturing methods. Again, we know who are the most vulnerable to climate change and the ones that contribute to it less. The 50% poorest people in France are the most vulnerable and are the first victims of climate change. And yet, they are the smallest contributors to climate change. So um, we know that there are many changes necessary for this transition. But again, I'm really, really cautious with, with these terms and concepts. Thank you, Manon Aubry. It's really interesting. and perfect transition, actually. We're talking about responsibility here. Who has the responsibility in this fair transition? We need to talk about the role of companies, the roles of the role of the beneficiaries, fundings. We need to talk about the role of the public powers. So We need this responsibility to be shared by all the different players. This is what we believe. As for labor, uh, I know that there are a lot of research projects in the field. Could you, Hélène, tell us about examples? Uh, what is AFD's approach? And how does it work? We have a lot of project on research and funding projects. And I agree with what, with what was said. There's a major injustice at global level on the contributors to, clim to climate change and the victims. It's a the, the most vulnerable people are actually the twi victims twice. So I do believe that this fan transition and the phenomenon of transition and the fact that we need to protect the environment and the climate will not be possible to be done in the same way in an emerging country or in a developed country. So I, th I again, it's really... Um, all about the context, as I said. So what we do at AFD is that we run a lot of diagnosis. So usually we respond to requests coming from our partner countries. We work with uh, local research centers. So for instance, if we work on a given country, we don't only work from Paris amongst ourselves. We work hand in hand with our partners in order to have a, uh, as good as an understanding as possible on the context. So we study inequalities. What is the state of inequalities in a given country, for instance? So we've, we have obtained uh, money from the European um, community for that. We study the impact of long-term transition both on the sector and on a macroeconomic level. So we have a toolbox to work on the tax impacts. So we do um, on, on the, the budget breakdown. We work also on ecological and environmental services. And again, we have many tools giving us the legitimacy to have a dialogue. And this dialogue has takes place at different levels. We have strategic dialogue memorandums in different countries, the countries that want to have them. Friends can sometimes have a um, long-lasting experience and people listen to us. So we create roundtables with different players. With Tunisia, for instance, we worked a lot on the impact of climate change on the agricultural sector with the Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperation and different organizations. So this is the first level, the political level. So we have dialogue at the political level in order to try and uh, see whether uh, the forecasts that we have are reliable. So we're really looking at this uh, vision 
And we also work on the local level because we firmly believe in governance, but I think that local action is essential. So this is done in complementarity. And before we initiate any action, we believe in analysis. We need to make sure that we know exactly what are the risks uh, in terms of exposure, what are the different impacts, who will be the winners and who will be the losers of these actions. And again, we initiate dialogue with the different uh, players. And of course, we have actions, uh, operational actions that I will talk about later on. And you work with unions, workers in Africa. How do you work in in Senegal? Do you have examples of uh, civil society involvement in different processes, or the lack thereof uh, of, of involvement of society of civil society? Well, I'd like to to answer your question, but I'd like to to start on a global level. You are all aware of the conference of the parties and how they work, including the 26th edition organized in Glasgow last year. It was supposed to be, it's supposed to be the technical means to make sure that all stakeholders would be around the same table to, to talk and, and discuss climate change. But what we have observed is that COP26 has led to hardly any action, anything really. There was hardly any involvement from the youth, and more specifically, the uh, southern hemisphere were not involved. The organizations from the southern hemisphere were mainly governmental delegations, but there were hardly any activists. So I, again, um, this raises a question of the, res the representativity of the civil society during these conferences. And the Sharm el Sheikh 27th uh, COP will probably not give a voice to civil society organizations because even if it's the Africa, it's in Africa, um, it's a remote place. There are only a lot of luxury hotels there um, and it will be for the elite again. And again, it shows us how much more work we need to put into this. Going back to, so this is why I wanted to talk about the global um, level, but I would like to talk on the on to talk about a more concrete aspect on what we do at Make Sense Africa, and I'd like to talk about the civil society in France, in underprivileged areas, live the populations that are the least hurt, and as was said earlier, they're the most hit, hardly hit by the consequences of climate change and, and these issues. So we want to promote popular education that would take into account climate change by, by making them more accessible, by readapting them to the constraints, local constraints. Because there's a lot of mistrust around social justice. And we don't talk about it enough in the public sphere. And it does not make people from these neighborhoods want to be committed, to become committed. And our role, we believe, is to stimulate this. Other organizations do it. Um, one in Marseille, there's one in uh, Bagnolet, and these are initiatives that are necessary across the French territory. Now, uh, going back to our action uh, in Make Friend, at Make Friends Africa on union movements, um, there's a real momentum nowadays in Africa, and yet it remains really complicated to be an activist uh, in the Southern Hemisphere for financial reasons or because you want to modify different things uh, done by the government that are more or less tolerant towards the civil society. There are a lot of movements that are created. And at the same time, what we want to do is to structure them. We want to support them, equip them, uh, give them a network to make sure that these movements become more professionalized and therefore more efficient in order to create a project. We have a project with AFD and CFE called Connexion Citoyenne, 
uh, where we support 25 project owners coming from 18 countries across the continent, and we help them implement projects that challenge political representativity or accountability of um, political politicians. In Togo, for instance, there was an, an activist called Roland Aziakia who Put into, who, who created a radio outlet in which he talked about the, the challenge of waste at local level, and he was able to become a an advocacy platform to challenge the government on what is being done locally on, and on whether uh, it meets the needs of the population. And I believe that this is essential. We uh, should really start from the grassroots, from the people who are the most hit, who are concerned, in order to redirect and to guide the policies that are adopted. Thank you. Great. Thank you for these examples. And of course, we see that it it is not amplified enough, and as much as it should, at least, to be replicated elsewhere. Niels, for companies, what about company responsibility? You have a responsibility. If we hear what we are saying, what people have been saying in this round table, as you said earlier, it's about leaving no one behind in this uh, model transition process. So do you have examples around you in the Global Pact, what is the role and responsibility of companies? Do, ro do companies take on this, uh, this role? Uh, the Global Pact is an initiative created by the UN for a fair transition because you were talking about the civil society and the UN uh, organization is about member states. It's member states that discuss global challenges, even if they don't always have the same perspective, um, even if the UN was mainly known for its peacekeeping missions following uh, the different wars and now they, they started working on development and in the 2000s just a, a little bit of background we've started talking about happy globalization we thought at the time that globalization was something that everyone could benefit from and that liberalization was a miracle the the, the best solution for everyone but it also came with a lot of challenges. Um, and Kofi Annan said that there was a responsibility from the UN, but also um, m &E also had their own responsibilities and that companies and multinationals needed to include human rights, the environment also in their action to become, so that companies became multilateral players of these challenges because companies, French companies that operate in Africa also have responsibilities regardless of the environmental and social framework in the country where uh, they are operating. This is where the, this is how the Global Pact was created and we've also supported um, a movement in Seattle. There were a lot of scandals on the roles of, of uh, MNEs. We tend to forget about these scandals, but the role, the mission is how can we um, on board economic players on the in this UN mandate to make sure that companies become willing to respect the 10 principles of this global pact through uh, the on the environment on the fight against corruption uh, climate change and this is how the global pact was created with uh, uh, Mr. Chirac and Kofi Annan in 2002 in France uh, to make sure that companies uh, become contributors to, to these challenges. It's interesting because companies have a role to play. Uh, this context has changed with the Loi Pact in France. We understand that now companies uh, factor in these, these notions of environmental um, rights human rights, etc., which is not always the case in other countries, in the UK, for instance, in, in Australia. Again, we said earlier that we all have our own definition of fair transition at European level. We don't always share the same definition uh, as unions, for instance. Uh, companies don't have the same definition as unions, and we don't have the same definition as other countries of the world. And this is something that needs to be implemented, and it's not always easy. Uh, these 10 principles are 
quite easy. We've talked about the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, these principles, these 10 principles are a foundation and we need to respect this minimum standard related to international texts. And there's this um, 2030 ag agenda on the 17 SDGs. And we see that the greenhouse gas emissions in Africa have reduced. It's easy in France because the industrial sector has been shrinking, so it's easy. However, we're importing a lot. We import one third of our carbon footprint is exported outside of the EU. And of course, uh, China is, uh, has tripled its um, emissions. So it's it's a way to tell companies, of course, your carbon footprint is low in France, but if you're importing your carbon or if you're exporting your negative externalities to other countries, uh, for instance, in China, but also in the Mediterranean uh, region, it doesn't work. You, we will not reach these objectives unless you don't have a global vision. So uh, 160 million children work uh, in the world. Same thing, if you don't make sure that your third party, your provider, um, your outsourcing company does not resort to child labor, uh, it won't work. You need to include this in your modus operandi because we're talking about social society, but uh, companies are also a major player. Of course, the public powers have a role to play, um, keeping in mind the, risk, the, the the constraints of states, of governments, because we don't, again, we don't have the same definitions, universal definitions, some, um, sometimes also are interpreted in different ways. And the social society, uh, civil society can be a driving force, but companies as well, companies can transform societies, um, m and can transform their production uh, means and methods and the environment, but also SMEs. So if we think about the transition as well, um, at the moment in Europe we're speaking a lot about uh, the responsibilities that we have to be vigilant. What about the global impact as well? And if we think about other um, enterprises that are in place, how what can we do in order to ensure that there are European regulations? And maybe it shouldn't be something that is just volunteer anymore. Maybe you could remind us of what this is all about and what will be the space given to this type of regulation in the future in order to facilitate a fair transition. Yes, I just wanted to bounce off the concept of responsibility and shared responsibility. Yes, it's shared responsibility, but responsibility isn't the same for each and every player. I'm not going to regurgitate the figures that I gave you before because it's 1% of the richest who have the highest carbon footprint compared to the 50% of the others. They're not the same responsibility. It's not the same duty when we look at uh, individual change and structural change as well. I would like to come back to the carbon four uh, study that was taken. If everyone had the perfect life, if everyone was doing everything by the rules, and this is something that would be very difficult, but I know that we are all green and eco-friendly here in the room, but if we said to the government that, okay, uh, rather than uh, if you become vegan, if you do this, if you do every single thing that we're tending to do, on an individual basis, you would have on the best uh, case 25 percent decrease and this will be very far from the trajectory that will be needed in order to really overcome the different climate challenges that we're currently facing within the framework of the Paris Agreement. And this is why responsibility, shared responsibility, does not mean identical responsibility because you have the state that is a collective organization and they have a very particular responsibility here. We're not just thinking about even if everyone had the will, even if we all said that we're going to have a complete renovation, we're all going to look at eco uh, moving from an agro-economic model, we can completely change the public transport system because everyone wants to leave the car at home. But if you're leaving your car at home, you need to have a public transport system in place that holds water. And for me, that's something that comes from the government and not from the citizen. And this comes back once again to the role of businesses. I am a lawyer. I have looked at human rights, but also social, economical and cultural rights and responsibility of multinationals. I also teach. And every time I say this to my student in the first students in the first year, I say, who is responsible when it comes to human rights? Who's responsible for human rights? And this is when we realize that legally speaking, there is only one player here. However, when we think about human human rights and environmental rights, it is the businesses, the businesses who, and I'm talking about a legal framework, there is nothing binding for businesses. 
We've got the right to vigilance or the responsibility to be vigilant in France, and that is the only thing that obliges businesses in France to respect any of these reclamation regulations. Rather, if we we know Total. Total is a French company. They are part of an international consortium, and there was a consortium of journalists that show how Total was involved in gas production that was being used by Russian aircrafts, um, Russian aircrafts that are obviously bombing Ukrainian civilians. It is a glitch in our system. There is impunity for these different multinationals, thus leading to a necessity to have a legal framework that goes well above and beyond just the will of different businesses. I'm not going to give you a list of everything that needs to be taken into consideration. However, why does this change nothing? This changes nothing because legally speaking, a business, and this when I think about international law, French law, or European law, businesses are not responsible, legally speaking, for the destruction of the environment. Look at Gazino, which is a French supermarket. They're involved in deforestation in Brazil. Nothing's happening. Camayu, Rano Plaza, other French businesses, Nike, Adidas, uh, uh, who have these factories in China. And they're not being held responsible because there is no legally binding instrument that holds them responsible and therefore victims are not able to ask for justice. Do you think this is going to change? Yes, this will change. I'm not sure if you want me to answer now because I know that I've gone into a lot of details about the directive, but yes, in a nutshell, it is a long-standing battle. Uh, it was my prior life uh, when I was in the associative sector. I was a, an MP, a European MP, and it's important to within the European Parliament to look at this. We've got beautiful democracy, and it is the only place where you as the people and we as parliamentaries, we don't have the right to propose initiatives. So what we can't do is say, okay, this is a proposal, but what we can do is we can amend the proposals put forward by the European Commission. However, in an absolute world, this is what we would like to do. This is exactly what we did when we started with our mandate in 2019. We had a report on initiatives that was given to the European Commission. The European Commission obviously was free to say we want to throw this away it's rubbish but that's not what they did there are eight european countries that either have a law on the right to vigilance or responsibility rather to vigilance either they're currently debating this therefore we said okay uh, we should have the same legal framework for all of the european member states this is how we were able to put this into place get the ball rolling but this directory is, is very far from the standards that we implemented in our parliamentary reports a parliamentary report that was supported by ne all of the different uh, parliamentary representatives and i'm talking about the left and the right obviously let's keep the extreme right to one hand because they don't care about human rights nor the environment Therefore, we are a direct representative of the people, and unfortunately, this is very far from the proposal. What did the European Commission do? A couple of months ago, the European Commission, in a nutshell, decided that they would look at the primary problem, which is the contractual issue. Legal responsibility is, needs to be within the contract between a supplier and the company, which means that if you're trying to make uh, companies accountable, responsible for what they're doing. You, you're buying your trainers, your Nike trainers here in France. You need to be able to look at what's happening in China and even the way that the products that are used to make your tra trainers have been, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I don't know what a Nike, I don't know what the different components of a Nike trainer are, but it's, that's not the point here. The idea is to look at all of the different parts of the value chain, but at the moment it's not the case, which means that you're nipping this in the bud because you cannot have vigilance if you're saying that Nike isn't responsible for things happening at its factory in China. We want to, the fact that the sanctions are very light, we, there are very f um, light uh, administrative sanctions. When it comes to competition law, you can sanction up to 10% of the turnover of a company, which means, yes, you can throw out fines when they don't respect the uh, competition law, but we can't do it when they're violating environmental rights or where they're destroying um, or pillaging the environment, which means that here you're saying that the environment and the and human life is not important as competition. 
this is why, okay, so we can sanction businesses, we can give access to legal, um, or legal um, uh, structures, and we talk about uh, turning over the burden of proof in this case. However, this is the, uh, at the heart of the matter when it comes to the different debates that will be uh, underway in Brussels. I'm actually going to be taking the train for Brussels this afternoon, so I'm going to have to leave very, uh, leave very earlier. And I hope this will also be the uh, chance for all of the different actors to be involved, the UN, the businesses, because there will be a real revolution from Brussels so that companies are being held responsible and being held accountable for what they're doing. And we can also look at different damages that need to be given to those concerned. Thank you very much. And we are going to try and keep you until the end of the roundtable. I hope so that we can continue in the discussion. And in the working group that uh, led to this uh, round table. We talk, spoke about definition and who is implementing what, what is being implemented, but what do we actually need to implement these different measures um, linked to a fair transition. For example, we need financing and we need governance, different governance. From a financing or governance point of view, we will be spoke, speaking to uh, Valeria about this, but there are other aspects that come into play. Do you think that what is the different governance that we need to implement with parties so that this there is a fair transition? Yes, financing is something that is of paramount importance for most organizations on an international point of view, but also for civil society in Africa, all of the different countries from the global south, generally speaking. For Make Sense Africa, we have a lot of hindsight. We are very aligned with civil society. This allows us to better understand and also better target our advocacy with funders so that we're able to have financing. Financing is often not very flexible in the sense that, okay, this is, this is when the window is that you can act as financing, these are the criteria, this is when you have to submit a, a proposal and it has to be done in this moment in time. And this because there was a calendar in place and you have to respect a deadline. There are different modalities that you need to respect as well. And this is also very important in order for us to be able to simplify the different means of access. Why? Because we speak a lot about international organizations, international NGOs. We were able to speak about this before during the uh, lunch break, actually. NGOs are able to share, to publish their projects, they win tenders, they're able to win different bids. However, civil society organizations don't have dedicated posts, dedicated positions, people who are actually responding to these um, bids. How can we ensure that civil society organizations do take up the space that they deserve. It's very complicated at the moment, but this is necessary and the, uh, we should be f facilitating access to financing. If we think about participatory budgets now, I think that the AFD is its a subject that concerns the AFD a lot. Why? Because if we think about budgets and participatory budgets, it's about putting into place a project and you're asking citizens to also become involved. There is a real sense of involvement which is essential if we want to make these projects sustainable because despite everything else in place, this is a real challenge for any NGO hoping to roll out a project because if you're waiting for financing, if you've got financing, everything's great. But at the end of the project, what happens? Two or three years down the line, if there's no more financing, there's no legacy left. Therefore, uh, the beneficiaries are left to their own devices. And this means that we should be thinking about this in a lot further detail, especially thinking about how we can involve members of civil society so that we can render these different activities sustainable. This is no mean feat. And I would like to give you another example of Make Sense Africa as well. What we've done in West Africa, looking at strengthening civil society organizations. We've realized that civil society is an important stakeholder in society in general. As Manon mentioned, 
they're not the main player. Uh, they're not. There are other actors as well, the government and other organizations. And these happen to be the voices that we hear prior to that of civil society. But actually, everyone who's sitting around that table has the right to have their voice heard. Therefore, we implemented a CGS. It's a youth consortium for Senegal because that's where we're based. We're uh, trying to roll this out in different countries as well. And the observation is the following. Makes sense. Okay, we're an NGO. There are lots of different NGOs out there. However, if we take ourselves, if we work in in silo, we're not strong enough. We have opinions, we have advocacy, but the impact is not sufficient on funders or on the government. Therefore, we've decided to work hand in hand with other organizations in civil society in Senegal and international organizations as well, because we said that the need was really local need as well. Therefore, we wanted to try and work with local players. This consortium was created two years ago with 10 local uh, organizations. We've got hubs, we've got local players. We work together and there are now 22 within the CGS, a CJS rather, looking at really changing the power balance with the government so that we have one voice, so that we have a lot, uh, a more systemic approach all the organizations are aligned despite the specificities and particularities, but we also know that the beneficiaries and the public is different. Therefore, we're working together in order to try and ensure that we are covering good ground and this in a lot deeper fashion. And we also want, we, whether there are any financing that CJS receives, we try and distribute this in an equal fashion between all of the different parties concerned so that ONGs, NGOs rather, have access to financing. What CGS was able to do is to get big funding and then redistribute this to smaller actors that would never have access would, would never have had access to this money without going through the consortium. And this responds to a current issue that needs to be corrected. If we look at the different types of action, we have implementation of physical spaces, we also have different areas that are made available so that youth, women, civil society come can come together to chat, to meet up, to find peers, to find uh, colleagues that they can work with, that they can commit with. And we also have a digital space that allows us to find opportunities because when you're in Dekia, in a West African capital, there is a lot more opportunity than if you're in a rural area. Therefore, we decided that we were going to use the different digital tools available to us, and this actually responds to other needs as well, linked to access when you are in a rural area. But obviously, we have to think about whether those in rural areas even have access to digital services. Sometimes we use low-tech, for example, WhatsApp, so that we're able to increase our outreach. And finally, above and beyond digital and physical spaces, we want to look at a citizen movement to allow us to speak as one voice with CJS for lots of different stakeholders, youth stakeholders. And we've also implemented governance that is different. The founding members of CJS also work with funders for a guiding council. We work with government governments. We're trying to handhold and bring them onto topics that are important to us. We were talking about social uh, entrepreneurship, solidarity, and so on and so forth. And obviously, civil society organizations who occupy a high number of seats. One uh, CSO for one funder, it's a one to one ratio, which allows us to even out the power struggle both within the CGS but also in the field. We are now kicking things up a notch. There are lots of different initiatives that are going to be implemented. They're very concrete, for example, the implementation of a startup house in order to support different projects uh, and different initiatives. Also allowing CGS to fund these different projects. One of the big issues that we see in West Africa is that you can find money when you have critical mass as a startup. However, in reality, we don't have critical mass of startups. The startups are just not big enough to access the financing that's out there. What can we do to ensure that these startups are able to hit that 
critical mass. We help them get started. We help them set up their activities, uh, which is something that wasn't uh, in place in West Africa because of the high risk. Therefore, we've put into place the startup hub or house so that we're able to help the startups get the ball rolling and have a real impact because it's not just about developing economic activities. It's about having economic activities that are going to meet the needs of the local population, thus allowing them to create an ecosystem that is favorable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. And Ellen, I imagine that you also will want to respond to the comments that have just been made. We see that there's a lot of things going on on the ground. There are different initiatives that exist, be this through civil society, uh, we speak about Africa, but also in other countries. The French Agency for, the, for Development, the AFD, has responsibility in this vein. How do you work when it comes to financing? What is the governance that you are putting in place in order to decide what the place of these social movements needs to be? And do you take into consideration what happens in order to determine how to finance different projects for a fair transition. Yes, prior to answering your question, I just want to repeat what was mentioned. Uh, there are different things at stake when it comes to implementation, lots of discourse, lots of great uh, intentions. However, despite the best intentions, if we take stock of uh, startups, we know that there's a lot of stagnation. One of the uh, colleagues mentioned during the lunch break that some of these startups are even regressing now. Financing is a key, but it is not the only key. If I come back to financing, though, I think that there are two different facets. Uh, we spoke about this earlier, and this also depends on responsibility that was mentioned. We've got the state, state-backed uh, financing. State financing is important, especially given their responsibility. And we also have local financing as well coming from CSOs. Why? Because implementation governance for the transition often comes from the field. We don't have ready-made solutions. There are no cookie-cutter solutions. However, what we can do is look at the desired future and look for citizen participation. Above and beyond now, just financing, let's be very clear, collectively speaking, we're slightly off the mark. We talk about billions of, uh, or we or there were pledges made for billions and billions of euros during COP21. However, we have six billion of climate financing coming from AFD and this year. We are trying to maintain this. This is a renewable effort. We're also trying to look at mobilizing not only other partners, especially on a local level, because once again, financing needs. We speak a lot about the sustainable development goals, but is there really a lack of financing, or are we just slightly off the mark? Because there's a lot of financing going to sectors that are not compatible with the climate fight. And this is where we speak a lot about orientation and guidance. Not only are we giving financing and complementary financing, but we're also trying to uh, have a say as with different um, stakeholders, one of them being the bon the Good Finance Club, but also the uh, Sustainable Development Bank. And I could go into details, but we have different meetings for Finance and Climate Summit each year. And we are involved in lots of different aspects of the coalition in order to try and mobilize financing for climate. And more specifically, if we think about a fair transition, South Africa was able to recently benefit from a program, Just Energy Transition Partnership, which was announced in Glasgow. And prior to this, the country observed that despite political will to move away from fossil fuels, and coal, there was resistance met on the ground, and that's normal because obviously there aren't. It's not just a win-win situation when you've got 50% uh, unemployment rate, and a lot of that employment comes from the coal sector. It is hard to persuade people to engage in a fair transition. Therefore, you've got five billion that was mobilised. France also was able to give a billion euros through AFD. So these are different types of initiatives that lead to financing. This is just one part of the solution. You've got governance, and which is another part, and AFD finances each year about 12 billion, 
of commitment, uh, and pledging rather, and we look at renewable energy, sustainable transport. We are also contributing to the fair transition agenda, but maybe not because up until now the different modalities for implementing the financing, uh, th there were um, things in the council balance. And we speak about the social impact on agriculture, for example. But we won't know what this is because we don't talk about this with the Ministry of Social Affairs. Therefore, everyone's working in silo, but we need to really break these sectorial silos, have dialogue between sectors and between ministers. And in order to do so, we need to bring everyone around the same table. Thus, bringing me back to my point of governance. And we're not quite there yet. We look at institutions. Uh, they're very heavily anchored. Uh, we need to change things up. It is essential. Why? Because we're going into the details of implementing the different projects. This is a real subject. And in addition, if we think on a local basis, how can we listen to the populations and also support all of the different movements, the citizen movements, that can be activists or not? Because you don't just have to be an activist, but the idea is to always be vigilant with regards to state governance, which may not be uh, egalitarian or equitable. We need to support local initiatives that are looking at implementing um, support on a territorial basis. And often, this because this is often the scope in which we're working. I mentioned this earlier. We have a whole program looking at research, but also action for this type of approach. A fair transition, conservation of the planet, uh, conservation of our resources is important. We have a community of users, but we also have rules of governance that need to be implemented. We've seen this time and time again in different countries. For example, in Lomé, you mentioned this, you gave an example about this, but Wallao as well, which is a fab lab looking for planet conservation in the urban in urban zones. We also have different land issues. How can we preserve land resources, especially in the Sahel region? Uh, common approaches, we're looking at conserving our oceans. We need to identify different communities and identify how we can support them. For example, in the DRC, we have associations looking at drinking water. We work with electrifying or des a decentrified, a decentralized rather electrification of the country. We need to pr promote all of this, but also how do we articulate this within the state and with the state? We are not quite yet there yet. This is something that we need to be speaking about. This is a concept because a common approach, yes, is great, but it can also be very difficult for some parts of the population. Therefore, we need great articulation with regards to the different scales at which all the scopes but we want to implement this within the government because fair transition is something that affects the national, local and international stage. And we are going to be starting to reflect and think about this and see if we can move to the action side of things with concrete examples. How can we finance local activities and how can we can try how we can try to adopt and replicate these different models? There is no one size fits all. We need to have a bigger reflection, we need to have more development. And what is the link between uh, questioning and maybe think, rethinking certain models with local initiatives? Are we looking at completely deconstructing and de pulling apart what's currently in place? Should we should should we be starting from scratch, or should, or should we be looking at cohabitation? So, this is things that we these are things that we need to be working on. But I also think that there's no w one answer. And these, it's important to take into consideration all the comp components. We spoke about standards earlier. This is something that we'll come back to as well. We work a lot in non-financial contributions as well for standards. And in my department, we work with central banks. Why? Because the, when we think about the ecological transition, it's something that needs to be appreciated from both a climatic but also biodiversity point of view. And what do I mean? I mean that we need to understand what the different elements are. We've got a lot of theory work that needs to be bashed out so that we're able to quantify the risks or vulnerabilities and also to see how regulations and regulation can be put into place so that we can maybe put into place things that are a bit more constraining than what are currently here. On this, all the way, all the while keeping and protecting the most vulnerable, um, those who will be affected by the transition. If not, nothing will happen.
Absolutely, and this is what's so challenging to reaching out, reach out to marginalized populations and not leaving them behind. Uh, there could be an implementation of the directive of the duty of vigilance, but we've talked about fundings. It is important to give the means to everyone, to the populations, maybe to companies as well. We'll see that later on uh, with Niels, to implement. But what are the means that are put into this, the complementary means to implement this directive? But also, what are the other means? What are the other resources? How do you perceive the, the notion of and the necessity for financing, because it's also about how the government and the state uh, perceives this, and how can we coordinate with the government? What are the keys for implementation? What, what are the keys for success in the sustainability, more specifically, of a fair transition? Well, if we only look at the duty of vigilance, what's interesting is that we have the experience uh, from the French legislation. Now, I wouldn't say that we have a lot of, uh, we can't really take a step back, but the law on the duty of vigilance in France was adopted in 2017, so it was about five years ago now. It was a hard fight uh, that we had to, to, to lead, and we finally obtained it at the end of the last presidential term and it allowed us to create a, a framework on a penal responsibility, the burden of proof. And thanks to this experience, I can say that if it, there wasn't the proof burden responsibility, victims wouldn't go, uh, even a victim on the other end of the world, wouldn't go to uh, a French trial because it is such a burden because it's so problematic when you don't know the language when you don't know the legislation so the the, the shift in the burden of proof um, is is was essential and also this notion of thresholds is important because we have about 100 companies that are concerned there hasn't not been despite requests from the ministry of um, finance to we, we've never had to give the names of the companies that are concerned because these are companies that are defined based on the number of employees at the end um, sites that they have in France or, and abroad, and abo abroad rather, but we've never had the full list. So just checking how companies fulfill their duty of vigilance is, is not enough. And again, it was at the end of the 27, year 2017, so the end of the presidential term. And there was also a guideline on the implementation of this law um, duty of vigilance. So it's about a one page and a half long. And the initiative report that we have, so it's a draft for a European directive, is about 80 pages long without the appendixes. And we uh, go much more in depth to explain the legal modalities. And I'm really insisting on the legal modalities because a legislation a law, if there's no legal framework for implementation, it's just a flagship. It's just uh, nothing. But we don't want a simple symbol. We want to have the legal tools to make sure that companies are held accountable. But above all, we want these legislations to avoid uh, uh, such harm. So, of course, we now have this legal framework, and it's good. We have we want to have this at European level, but it won't be enough. We don't want to stop there. We need to make sure that these pub, uh, public policies are uh, consistent. And I'm not. I'm going to to give you another example outside of the duty of vigilance in France. There was the climate law that was uh, voted. The objective is to reduce by 55 percent the greenhouse gases by 2030. By the way, we would still not be in line with the Paris Agreement because if it was in line with the Paris Agreement, it would be it would have to be 65 percent. Um, and it uh, and of course uh, this uh, doesn't even aim at fighting the. Uh, trading of, of uh, emissions, but it would allow us to have better policies in terms of, for instance, for cars, for thermal cars and uh, electric cars. But it's about uh, having consistency. Of course, I'm in favor of having electric cars, but what good is it, what use is it if we have free trade agreements where you can import products from the other end of the world? Um, you see, there's a there's a, a trade agreement between New Zealand and France, then the number one producer of um, beef and of 
milk and it makes no sense whatsoever to have this type of product coming from France even if while well, in France we have our, um, farmers that are not able to sell their product at a decent price there's a there are different texts that are really interesting a treaty with Russia that gives less responsibility and accountability to companies it's a way to guarantee fossil fuels so much so that companies, uh, states that want to leave this treaty on energy and on fossil fuels um, allows companies to go to court against the government um, com fossil fuel companies that can sue their government and I know that in Italy for instance the government had to pay a lot of money to a fossil fuel and company um, in Italy so these, we need to make sure that there's a consistency across the public policies to make them efficient and to operate this systemic change that we need. I, and as I said, I don't call it a transition, but rather a change in, in, in direction. Thank you very much, Manon, for these explanations. And thank you for giving us your stance on what's happening in France, because it is fundamental. But you were talking about uh, binding texts and binding initiatives. Um, it seems inevitable, right? We know that there are a lot of m more rules at European level. The harmonization of rules at European level are useful, is useful rather, this duty of vigilance for companies. How can this, how can we go further? Well, it's interesting because we see that uh, for, the, for these initiatives, the civil society organizations and companies have been playing a role incredibly strong. They um, allow us to accelerate these processes. Even if sometimes the parliament, I know that the parliament can be really fast and, and on other topics, it can take time because it's the time of democracy. We need, we need time sometimes. And what's interesting is that from our standpoint, this duty of vigilance law uh, in France relies on uh, John Ruggie's uh, princi principles, who was uh, working with Kofi Annan at the time. The principle is to protect, um, remedi remediate, etc. And we see that we were talking about governance earlier. The United Nations are a state organization. And we said that we needed a framework. And it's true that initiatives are asking for a framework um, with a clear guideline of what needs to be reached if we want to continue to survive on this planet by, in 2030. So this is the first thing I wanted to say. Second thing, from the UN standpoint, the UNHCR said that we needed to go further, and I agree with what Manuel has said. I, we talked about volunteering commitment. Ecuador and S South Africa in 2014 have started negotiations for a binding, binding treaty forcing MNEs to respect human rights and the environment. But we also know that it's complicated. Having this debate is not easy, but things are moving forward. This is the first thing I wanted to say on a legal standpoint. Secondly, for the concrete implementation of companies, we talk about companies, but we have a I have uh, 1,600 uh, companies in France, a lot of SMEs. We need to make sure that these companies, and to be honest, I, I, know n I don't know a single company in my network, in our network, that says that, that they're against human rights. But how do they uh, make sure that they contribute to the respect of human rights? Especially because we have so many companies that are outsourcing some services uh, with Tier 1, Scope 1, Scope 2, Scope 3. If we look at France, still SMEs are finding themselves in, in front of a very intricate situations because they need to respect the duty of vigilance and because you are my, they talk to their supplier and they tell them, I want you to respect the duty of vigilance, but they'll tell, you, they'll tell them how, I don't have any resources, any means whatsoever. You need to pay more. And then the large company will say, okay, I'll increase by 10%. 
But then the others will say, oh, I'm not I'm not concerned. It's your thing. It's your job to do that. So they find themselves in this predicament. It's not so much about money. This is what companies are telling us. To, they, it's not a money issue uh, to reach their objectives. It's more about targeting because there are so many players who's ready to pay um, the banks, the government, etc., and SMEs and the energy sector. It's the same thing. Who is ready to pay uh, f for the increase in the energy prices or cereal prices because of what's happening in Ukraine? Because some companies have already bought their raw material, but they need the energy to transform it. And this goes back to the notion of fair transition. And fundamentally, and here I'm mainly talking of the European framework, we talked about it countless times. And there's this approach between northern and southern uh, countries. They don't have the same impact. Impact. They don't have the same challenges or the same objectives in a way. So, but, but again, going back to France, SMEs are telling us, I, I'm happy to transform my company, but at the end of the day, who's going to pay 100% of this transition? The government can, okay, good. And then does a lot. But what about customers? Are customers ready to change their consumption habits? I think that there was a supermarket, and a supermarket always buys the same 15 products every year. So people have habits. They will always buy the same things unless the product changes. So it's, it's the, 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 the foundation of any transition. It's about behavior, and we need a behavioral change. And that's where it's difficult. And I'm giving you the example of the agricultural sector. It's very concrete. Look at cooperatives. If you tell them you need to change your production um, mode, you need to recruit people, you need to change the seeds that you're going to plant, they'll be okay. like, okay, sure. The only thing is that you're my only client asking me that. And the others don't want me to do that for different reasons, because they don't want the, pre the prices to increase for different reasons. But And they all have their own reasons. But it's really complicated. And the notion of transition raises the question of regulations. Companies are happy with regulation sometimes, but it's also about how the state and how the European Commission, especially for in terms of tax, European tax policies, and sometimes when Europe says, well, we want to be pioneers on, on different topics, we see also that it's complicated and that we've been postponing the implementation of some regulations and some texts. And this makes it even harder. But it's, it's also a financial issue that is radical, and it goes beyond uh, the notion of whether we have funds or not. We need a deep transformation of our societies, and we were talking about it amongst ourselves. We need a deep uh, transformation of our behaviors, and this cannot happen overnight, not as quickly as we'd like it to. We were talking about the youth, and I know that the youth has a major responsibility, but they don't. They, they, cannot be held accountable for a mu for much that that's happening for much that's happening and we can't just say well you know what it's your business now it's your future that's at stake <coughs> and yet we know that it's new uses new behaviors that we need and they are going to be the main drivers for this change this fair transition is not only about putting a band-aid or uh, creating different projects. It's we need a shift in model, which will require a new legislation, and companies will have to be involved. And our ourselves as citizens, we need to be involved as well. And I think that the summer we've experienced uh, only shows us that it is urgent. We can no longer escape. And if we want this transition to take, to take us to the other side, uh, we need this transition to be fair. I'd like to give the floor for a Q&A session. So we have a roving mic. If you want to ask your questions to Manon first, because she needs to leave. Of course, if you need to leave before the end of the Q&A session, we understand it. It's perfectly uh, normal. But over to you. If you have questions or comments, now's the time. Oui, c'est ça. <rire> voilà, allez-y. 
What can we do uh, individually? Manon, do you want to take this question? And maybe we can all answer that question, I'm sure. Well, I could say that you could fight, but I'll try to be uh, more concrete than that, especially because there are no upcoming elections in the next two years. But I'm actually half laughing. Personally, I've, I worked for organizations. I, have, I was a um, committed citizen, and now that I'm in the political sector, I hate politics more than ever. But there is no other way to change things than with laws and regulations. And the Zuji of Vigilance example is a great example of that. Now, in a very com concrete way, this uh, duty of vigilance, and I know it's going to be a challenge for uh, our negotiations. We have a very progressist agreement at the European Parliament that was voted upstream of the European Commission uh, with a large spectrum. I could give you the backstage discussions behind the negotiations, and it was probably my first time uh, doing advocacy. Thankfully, we were ahead of the lobbyists, but they caught up since then because part of the European Parliament that had voted in favor of this text, uh, namely the PPE and the right-wing party, and large companies mobilized in the meantime, and this is why we're not sure that we will have the same balance for this report and that we will have the same progressive, progressive elements. And on the duty of vigilance, I know that the NGOs that are working on this are numerous. I'd like to name some of them. Amnesty International, CCFDT, Terre Solidaire in France, and as part of a coalition called EECJ, European uh, for Corporate Justice, something like that. Apologies, I can't remember the exact acronym, but they are going to launch a major mobilization campaign for the civil society in the coming weeks. The objective is to put pressure on us European parliamentarians. Thankfully, I'm quite re receptive and, and res uh, I respond quite well to this. But uh, at the European Parliament, we receive a lot of texts. But it's it's we need uh, we need to take on these challenges. We've talked about taxes, tax policies in Europe, um, um, and we need to address whether uh, green actions need to be funded and at what level. Gas, uh, the the green, notion of green gas uh, is also something that is currently being discussed. But just to tell you that these organisations, um, these activists and, com and organizations that are um, very active are actually very, very useful. And if you have the opportunity to partake in one of these initiatives or events organized by these organizations, feel free to do so because, again, at European Parliament level is really, really useful. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, voting makes a lot of sense, you're right. And regardless of your convictions, of your beliefs as a consumer also, I think that you can change the game. Our um, behaviors are extremely conservative. As I said earlier, we have our habits, but we need to change also our behaviors as consumers. And we also need to commit. We need to be more committed. We need to become activists. As I said, the democratic timeline uh, and are, is long. It takes time. These processes take a lot of time. And I'm not, um, I don't regret it. I think it makes sense. We need to listen to all the different players. The civil society is also a, um, a major player that can help in the advocacy work, but companies can also play a role. I know that the reality can seem really complica complicated. We have this vertical systems. Uh, the states are, of course, really important, but the truth is um, these states, our governments are less and less powerful. And I know that we are moving from this vertical um, structure to a more horizontal structure, and we all have a role to play. So let's all commit at individual level and collective level. Thank you very much. You uh, are working on in the field with people. So what would you encourage us to do? Well, first, it's really hard to ask people to do anything. I think we all have responsibilities and roles. 
to fulfill. But I think that what I would like for people to do first is to get informed. There are a lot of t fights, uh, urgent fights that need to be fought. And I think that the first thing that needs to be done is to be informed, to, to, to get information on what is happening around us. And that's essential if, before you commit to anything. And also, secondly, you need to be surrounded with, with the right people to discuss these, these elements and to discover new elements. Feel free to discuss with other organizations. I personally am a member of different organizations, and I know that in the past few years, my commitment has only grown because I was surrounded with people who wanted to discuss different topics and they've, they've showed me why there was so much at stake uh, on, the, on different topics and, and this depth of, 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 of necessity. And also, we should keep our ethics because uh, as citizens, we're all working for companies. We also have uh, political biases. And keeping this strong ethics in our daily activities, daily actions, is important because our actions matter and have an impact. So think about it before you buy something, before you go somewhere, before you hop on a, on a, on a plane. Think about it. Think about your daily, ac your daily actions. Thank you very much. What is our role? What can we do? Well, the civil society and the youth need to resist the temptation of saying, well, it's all doom and gloom. There's nothing left to do. It's over. Um, I think we should avoid extremes, either radicalization or disinvestment. Of course, there is urgency, but regardless of the situation, we see uh, that we are resilient and uh, one single action can have a huge impact, provided that people commit. And also, we should have this open-minded uh, and especially during crisis, people tend to um, to be more close-minded. It's it's uh, it's a problem with uh, people being rejected. Borders are being closed. We should really resist this. We're all in the same boat, so we shouldn't think that we can protect ourselves if we isolate ourselves. That is not true. We need to collectively resist these temptations that are always detrimental, uh, and history has shown us that it's very detrimental. I don't want to give you examples of, of past wars, but um, I urge you to remain positive, committed. And I do believe in political actions and this relationship between political actions and citizen actions need to be reconciled at one point. We are lucky because we live in a democracy. So let's use this. <laughs> I'm, as I'm here speaking as a French citizen. This, uh, this is what I do at least. Thank you, Ellen. I don't know if there are any other questions. We still have a few minutes. As I was saying, uh, the extreme right is rising with transition, human rights, and environmental rights being less and less regarded because of that. How can we fight this, and how can we avoid this erosion? I can't have an exhaustive answer to that question. It's a very good question. I don't have any set answer to it. What I can simply say is that we need to listen to people. I know that in what we what we are working on in cooperation, we try as much as possible to listen to people. Um, listening to one another, having dialogues, understanding one another, listening to people's pr proposals is something that allows us to understand one another because extremism only rises from lack of knowledge, lack of understanding. Uh, that is why it's, I, I think at local level we can work. Uh, this is why the skills matter so much. 
Um, in the Sahel region, for instance, there's a rejection of friends. Uh, in Mali, for instance, we still have research projects in Mali, and they're very fruitful because we know the researchers, and it's, it works really well. So you need to fight against this lack of knowledge. Um, it, this is, of course, a long-lasting effort that we need to put into it. We need to respect one another and not have this top-down approach with um, one size fits all type of solutions. But we need to bear in mind that everyone has a word and everyone has a say. Uh, we need to have this co-construction in mind uh, when creating projects. Extremism and radicalization have always used large economic crises. In times of shortages, tensions rise, so let's bet on and work for a prosperous future. Of course, there are ideological notions, but I have worked on sustainable prosperity and firm better equity because the erosion of uh, this social link is related to inequalities. So I do believe that the social agenda will be paramount in this context. I'd like to add one thing. Uh, on, on extremism. In our democracies, there are not many safeguards. First, this fair transition is one of the tools that we can use to fight this uh, the rise of extremist ideologies. We cannot think about growth where one portion of our society does not benefit from this growth. To put it differently, we cannot have people who are getting richer and richer next to people who are becoming poorer and poorer. This is one thing. And the safeguards are hard to find. I think that one of them uh, is, of course, to commit and to vote. When you don't vote, it means that you let the most committed ones uh, vote and decide, the ones with the uh, um, strongest beliefs. And we see this in Europe, in the US, people are saying, well, I don't think that, that doesn't matter, it's pointless, etc. It does. We need to accept that democracy is a long process, it requires debates. We tend to be so polarized because of social networks where it's about you, you're right, you're wrong. It's not, this is not real life. We don't have this instantaneous uh, skill here. The United Nations is sometimes blamed uh, because they take too long, because they also take time to listen to ideas, to have confrontations. Sometimes it can be violent because they're major um, disagreements and the democracy um, is a fight uh, based on words and it, it doesn't seem as visible as weapon-based fights but we still need to respect this time and we need to respect the DNA of our Western societies. We tend to forget about it because the urgency of these situations um, make us think that we need an urgent response, that's true, but it takes more time, labor, forced labor. We didn't talk about women, women's rights. Um, the environmental crisis, the climate crisis requires us to fight, we've, we've said it. And we've heard many different players take the floor around this table. We've, but as citizens, we are all fighting on our end. But this is why, again, I believe in the SDGs, because this is a universal foundation. Thank you, Niels, very much for this word of conclusion. This is the end of this roundtable. Again, I would like to thank each and every one of you for your participation and your contribution. Thank you very much for being so numerous in this room. Thank you for being so active for this interactive session. And yes, we are going to have to fight each and every one of us in order to save the planet, but above all, uh, the men and women who live on this planet, all of the men and women, the most marginalized of us included, otherwise we won't manage. Thank you very much. I wish you a beautiful Convergence Forum, Convergence 3.0, between this afternoon and tomorrow. Thank you.